So the challenge by, by Ivan Krastev in, in his book, After Europe, is that political scientists specialize on European integration. We've thought a lot about integration, uh, and we have contending theories of integration, but we lack a theory, or even contending theories, on Europe's disintegration. And if we're honest, we should have theories about disintegration, or at least try to understand not only how integration works, but when and how integration enters into crisis, and when and how eventually um, disintegration may happen. You know, the Roman Empire, the Soviet Empire, Yugoslavia, there are enough inst instances in which, uh, you know, we've seen bigger towers <laughs> collapsing than the European Union, and the fragility of the European Union as a construct should lead us to try and understand, you know, under which circumstances and how can it uh, enter into not only crisis but into disintegration. If we want to preserve the European Union, we should also understand its fragility. It's not the end of history uh, in terms of all the future or for all the future um, we will always have the European Union and we should take that for granted. We should be very we should be very careful about that, so we should take on the challenge uh, by Ivan Krastev to try and understand European integration, crisis and disintegration. Part of the problem is that the risks uh, of uh, disintegration uh, that we see and we witness today are embedded in the DNA of the model, on the original model. And without going a lot back into European history and European integration, I think that the decisions which allowed uh, the Founding Fathers to get this process in motion and which has led to enormous and substantial successes uh, contain the seed of problems uh, at the same time of you know, the, the seed for those success, successes. More particularly, the neglect of politics. We moved from an attempt to build in Europe from top, uh, from the top, you know, a, a top bottom, and we decided to, to do a bottom-up process. We left politics aside in order to do economic integration. So we decided to ignore politics. We decided to um, to work from the economy and from below, um, and therefore we postponed politics and we left politics, the finality politics was at the end uh, of the process. We, we needed to do it that way because we needed to transform the states, we needed to transform the nations, we needed to create a base in the economy and in societies for that process. But it is as if you push the problem and if you push reality towards the future and one day <laughs> that reality will come back and haunt you. And Political scientists have been arguing for politicization for years, saying, you know, we need politicization. This technocratic construction cannot work without politicization. Now we have politicization and we don't like it. <laughs> no. We have got too much politicization. Politicization can kill uh, a patient which is weak or weakened because of the economic crisis, because of the Brexit, because of that. So the shock of politics, which has finally come, it's a, it's, a, it's a very existential shock because in the original plan it was always the idea that let's do technocracy, let's do depoliticize, let's do low politics economy and so on. So this is, uh, looking back into the, to history, one part of the problem, we inherited that problem from, from history. So the process has entered into crisis and I think, or at least I propose to, to look at this crisis in terms of uh, a revolt of uh, consisting of four elements. I would say that there is, there is a happening in parallel, a revolt of the elites, a revolt of the publics, a revolt of the markets, and as a political scientist I have to say a revolt of the theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the revolt of the elites is visible in elites fearing, leading the process, becoming followers, the sign showing that they're lost, um, showing uncertainty. Uh, we've left the nation state. 
we've left Egypt, you know, uh, and there was a promised land of European integration. But 40 years later, you are in the middle of the desert, uh, supranational democracy, the European Union as a, the, the United States of Europe, they look very far still. Uh, people revolt, but the elites also hesitate. And, you know, what do you do, you know, do you go back? It's, uh, is there any meaning or any possibility of going back? Uh, should you just ask people for another leap of faith and, and move on? Um, so elites have stopped performing their role in terms of leading. Um, and, 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 and this, this creates a, a huge problem, you know, and we see that it happened already in the past, but I think it's quite visible uh, today in the lack of leadership. The revolt of the publics and the revolt of the citizens, again, uh, for the last two decades after the end of the so-called permissive consensus on European integration, after 1991, um, we've seen that every time we put to test European integration to the public in referenda, it backfires. Um, so, so publics have become very anxious about about the European integration, um, and there has been a lot of uh, integration fatigue among uh, citizens. The, the third revolt is the the revolt of the markets. Um, the main mode of legitimization of the European integration process has been through economic growth, and this is what sustained. Uh, the permissive consensus in the past. Uh, when something works well and to your benefit, you don't ask and you don't ask questions about how it works. If your car works, you don't open the trunk to look what happens inside. When your car stops, then for the first time you have to find, you know, you don't even know where you open it. You know? So but the economy was sustained in European integration and the economy stopped sustaining European integration and started producing uh, more anxiety and criticism on the European integration after the financial crisis, especially in 2008. And whereas in the 80s and in the 90s we had a virtuous process of integration center periphery and the markets liked liberalization and European integration, after the financial crisis markets have not liked uh, uh, European integration that much, either because it was slow or because uh, monetary integration was not working properly. So we are in an era of low growth or stagnant growth, high unemployment, especially in the periphery. Uh, so, so the markets have also broken uh, this virtuous relationship with the, with the European integration process and have contributed to weaken its uh, legitimacy. The, the, fourth, uh, the fourth revolt um, is the revolt of the theory, and it may, uh, it may sound uh, as a typical you know, claim by a political scientist that we are very important, but in fact it is important because at a moment in which uh, we wanted to democratize the European Union, um, if someone enters into my office and says, I want a supranational democracy, and you know, I don't have one. I don't know how a supranational democracy looks like. We haven't done this before. I know how to give you a liberal democracy, even if I know that then, you know, it generates problems and so on, but the software for running a liberal democracy is more or less known. You know, you just need division of powers, elections every now and then, you know, transparent media. We know that in practice it's difficult to deliver, but at least we have a model, you know, you can download and then you can tweak it to your national context. In some places we think maybe it's impossible, because of cultural you know, problems and so on, but generally, as a political scientist, if I'm teaching political science, I have a model to deliver. If I change my heart and I, ch and I teach the political system of the European Union and you want a supranational democracy, I, I, I look weird. I don't know whether to do division of powers, to have president of the commission elected by the people, indirect democracy, direct democracy. Should we have 27 commissioners? Uh, is the commission a government uh, or not? Uh, who governs in Europe? So, so, so we, we force theory to, to give us a supranational democracy and theory has said, look, you know, I have direct democracy and it happened 2,000 years ago, 
mm -hmm. and I have liberal democracy mm -hmm. in nation states. It happened, you know, 200 years ago, and we are still figuring it out. Uh, you know, come back in 200 years <laughs> if you want to know how supranational democracy is. You know. To pose the question in terms of uh, what I like to think there could be called like three revenges. You know. There is the revenge of history, the revenge of geography, and the revenge of demography. You know, thinking that Europeans were able to transcend these three things because we're so great, you know, as a, as a power that we could ignore history, geography, and demography. Um, and this European dream, which was basically about ignoring the realities of these three deep-seated uh, factors, uh, has come back and, and haunt us. So, the revenge of history, uh, I know that there's been a lot of simplification in terms of what Fukuyama actually meant with the, with the end of history. But he did actually mean that, in terms of models, competition about models of organizing political and social life history has ended, that there were no rivals to liberal democracy. Uh, so, uh, of course, intellectually, but also even uh, practically. And unfortunately, um, you know, we're not so sure today about the fact that liberal democracy is a superior form of uh, civilization, which therefore will lead it to, uh, to stay forever. We've seen uh, liberal democracy going into crisis. We've seen populism and nationalism on the rise. We've seen democracies going backwards or becoming illiberal, not in all parts, but in some parts, like media, judges, corruption, and so on. So, it, I mean, the jury is still out, but you know, you should not take for granted that um, well, the Chinese, of course, think that uh, there are alternative models to liberal democracy. Uh, not sure to which extent what the Russians do is a model in terms of how do they sell the model. Probably it's just a survival uh, experiment for themselves, but they don't export the model, uh, uh, at least theoretically <laughs> or in theory. But it's true that, uh, that liberal democracy is into crisis. And with it, uh, the idea that you could build the European Union as a perfect post-everything, post-national, post-state, post-modern, I mean, all those posts are now uh, being removed. So we're going back to nations, states, uh, and identities. And no wonder that uh, Fukuyama's last book is on identity and the return of identity and on the strength of identity as an, as an explanatory factor of, of, of things. And on geography, Europe was built or developed on the premise that you could have an ever-expanding uh, territorial logic, that you could overcome border after border, not only with the original uh, founding members, but then in successive enlargements, but even outside uh, the, the boundaries of, uh, of former Western Europe, even into penetrating into the format, uh, in the former Soviet Union, but also outside the world that you could create a sort of Eurosphere with people that were like-minded, people that didn't care anymore about uh, nations, states, and identities, you know? So it was an ever-expanding logic uh, able to overcome all sorts of borders. But look at how geography has come back inside Europe, um, in our neighborhood and uh, outside Europe. Uh, inside Europe, whereas uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, borders didn't matter in the deep sense, you know, it's even, I mean, in the, in the cultural, uh, religious, and political sense, but now it's commonplace again now to talk about Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox Europe, to talk about the Hanseatic League to talk about North and South Protestants and, and Catholics. And this is the, a crisis reflected after the 2008 crisis, which reintroduced all the stereotypes uh, which uh, Europeans thought we were free of. Spaniards, one day we were the Prussians of the South when we were growing, uh, and we were so proud to be called the Prussians of the South. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a, Prus a Prussian of the South? You know, it's like a... 
an ISO 9000 certificate put on your everything you do, you know. Mm -hmm. So one day we were the Prussians of the South, and then you know the, what the economies uh, was again going back to all these stereotypes of siesta and fiesta, you know, <laughs> and uh, Spaniards <coughs> taking long naps and having fun and not being productive and not paying their debts. I'm sure you've heard very similar stories about yourself. So, and then in the neighborhood, we've seen the return of the idea of spheres of influence. Geography matters. You should not enter into some people's backyards, or some people wouldn't want you to enter into the areas because they claim they have different values. You're, we are not like you. It is okay to trade, uh, but we are not assuming all the order that comes with it. And that means that enlargement has stalled, that um, the Arab Spring has uh, not, not only failed, but not even not, not, but stopped looking at Europe as a model. And even with Brexit, uh, we see that, uh, that Britain has going, gone back to the old politics of uh, divide the continent from the outside you know, rather than from, from, from the inside. So in the neighborhood, we've seen geography and spheres of influence coming back. And outside Europe, uh, geopolitics uh, is back. Uh, and this is a game Europeans cannot play or do not know how to play. We need multilateralism, not multipolarism. Uh, we've been writing essays and books about uh, Europe as an herbivorous power, Europe as a normative power, uh, Europe as a commercial power, or a, a, but. Um, discussing about our soft power and all these elements of postmodern rule. But the reality is now more multipolar um, than multilateral and more about carnivorous <laughs> power and uh, an old type of power than, than only normative power. So when Europe thought that Americans would have hard power and we would have soft power and everything would be fine, uh, this is not anymore uh, the case. So die-hard uh, geopolitics are, are back. And then in terms of the last, the last element is the demography, the, the revenge of demography. We also thought, uh, probably like the Japanese, you know, that uh, the demography did not matter anymore, uh, even physically, <laughs> you know, in terms of the, of the sheer numbers of, of, of citizens that you could have. But the challenge today is that it's quite impossible to make Europe without Europeans. Without Europeans in the political sense, of course, in the sense of demos. If there is not a people feeling uh, such, where is the European people? Uh, in the physical sense, you know, in, in terms of the demographic winter and aging dynamics, which are not compensated by uh, openness to immigration. Contrary to that, by a refusal and a rejection of immigration, which deeps which deepens uh, the demographic uh, winter and which makes it more difficult for, for Europe uh, to be uh, relevant uh, uh, in the world. And then with the decision of the European Council to postpone Brexit to Halloween, <laughs> which is, I don't know whether they did it on purpose, but this you know, trick or treat. <laughs> thing is quite creative in terms of the challenge that adds on to uh, onto, onto leaders. Um, it reminds me of uh, adolescents, you know, going around the door. This is what uh, Theresa May has, we will be doing on, on Halloween day, you know, knock the door and say trick or treat. Um, but uh, even more seriously, in more religious terms, you know that uh, 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 it's the day of the saints. Uh, and my only optimistic hope about Brexit is that, as you know, in Mexico, the Day of the Saints is also the Day of the Death. is is the day which in which those who left come back. So <laughs> there are two readings of uh, the first, the first of December of, of October. Is it is is it either the day on which the beloved leave, or or those who left come back? So, you know, I, I cannot be more happy with, uh, with that day for Brexit, <laughs> for, for the deadline. Thank you so much.